Hey, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being here today. And uh, some of you are standing in the hall. We're going to do this for about 30 to 40 minutes. Feel free to come in and take some of the seats up here. But we want to be able to have a, uh, a good dialogue with you. What we've done today is we want to be able to go and confront the brutal facts and talk about what we see as a critical gap on the battlefield. And we're really talking about terrain shaping and a capability we used to have 30 to 45 years ago. Very, very distinguished panel here. Uh, the three guys up front are uh, both a lot better looking and a lot smarter than me. But we try to look at the three or four different aspects of this particular problem. As the chief of engineers, I've been obviously a tactical guy, and now we're in there to try to make sure we can find the right programs. Jim Rowan, former battalion and brigade commander, now he's the deputy commandant out at Fort Leonard Wood, understands TRADOC, understands how to write a requirement and to be able to help champion through that system. Jonathan Slater is with us from the acquisition community, one of the best 06s out there working these programs, and we're real ha proud to have him here to work through this. And Mark Himes, if you, whatever we build in the Army, if we aren't looking to somebody that's got tactical experience, muddy boots, to be able to make sure we understand how this thing's going to be employed, uh, then we aren't doing the right thing and the right service to our soldiers and our leaders. So Mark's here, just got out of command. He works for us in the Pentagon, and all four of us is going to kind of walk you through real quick of where we're at. So let me just uh, kind of tell you a couple of challenges we have here. When you think of where we were when Jim and I were lieutenants, 1979, we had a lot of capability out there. And you're really going back to what do we need to do as a maneuver force and what do we, do we need to do as engineers to be able to make sure we're enabling that force. We've got to be able to own the terrain. We've got to be able to have this expeditionary maneuver and whatever it is, joint combined arms, we've got to be able to work through the depth of the, uh, of the battlefield. And I think it's, it, it's incumbent on all of us to be able to visualize what we need to do, to be able to understand that, and our subordinate leaders understand that, then how do you shape the battlefield, and how do you control that terrain? Go to the next one real quick and one past this. Go to the next one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through an architecture, and this is regular, normal, easy to understand, red, green, amber. Okay, green is good, red is bad. And I want to kind of walk you through where have we been in the last 39 years with respect to our ability to shape the battlefield. This slide you'll see for the next several slides in the briefing. My three experts here are going to talk to you about where we're going to fix some of these challenges out there. <clears throat> Dimensions. Current, this is uh, where we were, 80 to 2010. This is today. Jim's going to walk in more detail. And then this is where we need to go, 15 to 20 years out, near term. You talk about readiness and modernization, you talk about engineers, I can't think of a bigger gap we have on the battlefield right now than terrain shaping. We've done very well in construction equipment, we've done very well in the ability to be able to counteract IEDs, we've done well in bridging, but this is a gap that's going to get soldiers killed in our inability to be able to be lethal on the battlefield. So now I'm going to walk you through depth depth of this space here. I'll just use a couple notes here, but the bottom line, when you think way out, deep fight, we're talking probably out to 300 meters, way out in the deep fight. Back 30 years ago, we had the ability to be able to put in Gator minefield. Gators de deployed mainly by fixed wing, uh, Air Force, Navy fast movers to be able to put mines out on the bottom. You'll see a lot of little blocks today. Every one of these little blocks is about a kilometer of minefield. I'm going to tell you what the aggregated amount of all those mines that we used to be able to put in. And I'm going to tell you what do we have now with loss of that capability. So clearly, deep, way out here with Gator. When you think about mid, we're thinking about 24 kilometers out on the battlefield, our ability to shape the battlefield and to shape the enemy. This is defense in depth, two brigade combat teams side by side, and the ability to be able to impact deep and to be able to shape mid. What we had mid, 24 kilometers out, was we had Adam and Ram. Artillery delivered minefields that could go in. Those were mixed, anti-vehicle and anti-personnel. And then we also had a capability called air volcano. They'll talk about volcano, but this is the ability to put a minefield uh, a detonation packet on the side of a helicopter, fly it out 24 kilometers, and you'd be able to put that volcano minefield out in the ground. Now let's get down into the close fight, direct fire ranges. These are two brigades side by side. All the green boxes you see there 
are what's called deliberate obstacles. That's when we used to have ability to go down to the mine dump and we would pull out of there the, the capabilities we had, both AT and AP, M14, M16, M15, M19, M21. Massive amount. We used to be able to put them in sometimes with different type of uh, employment techniques that could come right out of the back of a dump truck, go right on the battlefield, and an awful lot of depth that we could do to be able to protect that brigade combat team and to be able to know where we wanted to kill the enemy, shape them into the right place, and then to be able to really help that maneuver force. Right behind the deliberate minefields were situational minefields. If you have a gap and all of a sudden you've got more enemy coming on a flank, how do you somehow do you have the ability, I'm talking a half an hour out, to move something over there to put down a hasty minefield? So this is where we had volcanoes, ground volcanoes, we also had a system called Mopums to be able to come back in and to be able to shape this. Altogether, this is about 35 kilometers of minefields. Here's what you need to know. This fight is a three brigade fight, three BCT fight. We could do it with two BCTs because the enabling multiplying effect of all these different systems equaled about the equivalent of another brigade combat team. And Jim and I both remember when we were in 1st Armored Division or supporting the fight, you'd have the whole situation laid out, we'd be on a hilltop with a DTAC, and we'd be sitting there with a one star telling us, here's what we've got to shape deep to be able to get way out, here's what we've got to do to be able to attrit in the mid-battlefield, but here's how we've got to start directing down there. BCTs moving engineer battalions around, the artillery guys there, I'm there, the maneuver commander's there, trying to figure out how do all of us work together to be able to take out some of that enemy. This is where we were. Now I'm gonna go real quick. Black means we don't have that anymore, okay? We don't use AP in the US Army anymore. It's not in our inventory. We have taken it out. Gator was one round, anti-personnel and anti-tank in the same round. Now that you don't have that, you got a challenge out there. We can use it in Korea in very certain circumstances. You can use Gator. We do not use it outside of Korea. So take 300 kilometers off of your um, spectrum. It's not there. Think about mid. We don't have Adam anymore. That was the anti-personnel, so now you only have RAM. That's the, and those, the problem we're having there, shelf life issues with those two rounds. Same thing with Air Volcano. We don't have much depth there. Now go to the close fight. All those mines we don't use anymore. We don't have M21s we put on the battlefield. So that's out of the inventory. All you got left was Volcano. And what did we do in 2001 when 9-11 happened? We parked our volcanoes in the motor pool. We started doing 17 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and those things were rusted in the back, back 50. So now it goes back to you have a system that's about the only thing left, and it's old, it needs to be recapped, and we've got to be able to make sure we don't even use the AP, we only use the AT. How are you going to fix this? What we're going to walk you through is some innovation we're really trying to do in the, in the, in the regiment to be able to lean on some of the greatest technology. Some of the contractors are here in the room. I went to see them yesterday and I got briefings on their particular systems. But if we don't figure out how to solve this as an army and as a joint force, we're gonna to continue to have our soldiers on the battlefield be exposed where we could have done an awful lot if we take a little bit of investment now to be able to buy some of these critical systems. Jim, I want you to walk in a little bit more detail and help us walk through this. Yes, sir, thanks. I'm gonna talk a little bit today about you know, obstacles in general and then uh, how we got to where we are and then tease you how we uh, are gonna fix it. Next slide, please. What you see here is a, a couple diagrams. On the left, you see a coin sort of situation. On the right side, you see a major combat operation. And the point here is we're going to use obstacles across the range of military operations here. On the left side, you see the obstacles to achieve the effects of interdict and deny. You also see one for, uh, for security, a protective obstacle around that base camp. But the focus today is not going to be on protective obstacles. It's going to be on tactical obstacles. What you see on the right is the more traditional obstacle effects of turn, block, fix, and disrupt uh, in a major combat operation. Obstacles shape the operational environment. They allow us to obtain a position of relative advantage to the enemy. That's a key tenet of maneuver warfare. It was a key tenet in the 1980s, and it's still a key tenet of multi-domain operations. As the chief pointed out, they are a clear force multiplier. In this 
fight depicted on my left here, we get three BCTs worth of combat power by using two BCTs and, and the minefields as an effector. And they also protect the force. While we're able to achieve that position of uh, advantage against the enemy, we can deny the enemy from doing that so they will protect the force. About 10 years ago, we tried to make this argument and we were in a different fight, it was a different world back then, and there were a lot of people who said, you don't need this. You're a legacy thinker. You're a cold warrior. Nobody will ever maneuver against the U.S. Army again. We're just too good. And if anybody was dumb enough to try to maneuver against us, we'll just kill them with joint precision fires. Well, the situation shown on the right side of this chart today has come back. It's here. There are realistic scenarios where we will fight a peer competitor, and we will need the ability to shape terrain. I will highlight that, as I said before, this is completely consistent with the multi-domain battle. Matter of fact, the direct lift from multi-domain battle talks about dynamically integrating and converging obstacles with terrain and fires in depth will deny enemy freedom of maneuver or positional advantage and enable friendly army formations to fight when outnumbered. Next slide, please. So the chief talked about how we used to set the, set the step battlefield, and uh, he mentioned Gator. And again, we're going to talk about landmine policy in a minute, but Gator was our only deep solution, and we, we can't use it anymore because it has that anti-personnel component. In the mid-range, we had the artillery and the aviation-delivered obstacles. Again, we can use the ones today that we have that are only anti-vehicular pure. None of the AP systems are compliant with our national policy. So not only have we made our mid-range obstacles a little bit less effective by taking out the anti-personnel component of it, we've clearly reduced our inventory of supplies we have. Anything we had that was a mixed system is now off the table. The close fight, as the chief mentioned, you see there, this part of the battlefield, that was 18 to 22 kilometers of obstacles, explosive obstacles. Now, we have other obstacles. We have constructed obstacles, anti-tank ditches, uh, wire obstacles, those sort of obstacles. But they're logistically and manpower intensive. And if we're going to get 18 to 22 kilometers of frontage, we really needed to rely on the row minefields. The systems we use here, the ones the chief mentioned, the first couple of the anti-personnel systems, we quit using those, again, by our policy, not anything that a uh, treaty compliance, just our own decision. We quit using those in 1999. But the biggest one that uh, decision that hit us was after 31 December 2010, U.S. policy said we will not use any non-self-destruct anti-vehicular minefields. That's this row here. That's the M15s, the M19s, the M21s you see on the slide. They were really the foundational obstacle for us, and we've taken those out of the mix. We also had ground volcanoes, and as the chief said, that was meant to be a situational obstacle. You reacted to the enemy's uh, movement. You closed the gap. Now what we're seeing in, at the CTCs is because there is no directed obstacle capability anymore, units are trying to employ ground volcano in its place. And again, they're trying to employ it as a deliberate obstacle. It's not what the system was designed or meant to be done. And so clearly, it's, it's uh, having a substandard result. Let's go to the next slide, please. So there have really been a, a number of policy decisions over the years, but there's two of them that have had a huge impact on how we fight. The first one I mentioned was the anti-vehicular, non-self-destruct mine policy. We said, as effective 31 December 2010, we will not use those. Trouble was, when we said that, we had a, had a plan to replace them with a different system that, that never materialized. And when we said that, and it happened on 1 January 2011, we really didn't notice it. We were in a different war, in a different part of the world, in a different fight. We weren't fighting this fight every month at National Training Center. And so when this policy took effect, it really wasn't noticed until we got back to the basics and large-scale combat operations again. That was the first policy. The second policy that you know, has had a significant impact on our capability and the gap we're talking about today was presidential policy decision number 37. That was signed in January of 2016, but it was published in a White House announcement, an unclassified version, in November of 2014. 
And what the unclassified version pretty much said was, we will operationally comply with the Ottawa Treaty. Now, Ottawa only deals with anti-personnel mines. It doesn't worry about anti-vehicular mines. But it said that we would not employ any anti-personnel mine that was not Ottawa compliant outside of the Korean Peninsula. So all our family of scatterable mines, our fast camp system that had anti-personnel mines in it, because they weren't Ottawa compliant, they did not have a human in the loop, they, uh, we lost the ability to use those. When that happened, we lost all our Gator. Gator has a mix of AP and AV. We had the PM look at, maybe we could crack open those uh, cluster bomb units and, and take out the anti-personnel mines, replace it with ballast. Uh, it turns out for a number of reasons that was infeasible. Again, we get to the, the mid-range fight. We still have some AV pure mines we can use, but again, the inventory is reduced and the effect is less. Uh, the conventional mines we talked about. Uh, the other point I want to highlight on this slide is that bottom call out bolt written there in yellow there. And it says, you know, we've studied this and we've modeled it and we've looked at it very carefully. And the US Army can fight and win without these lethal obstacles. We can do it. If we're going to fight and win without these lethal obstacles, the impact of that is it will require more BCTs, more armor, more artillery, more aviation, more things to support all those combat forces, and we will expect more casualties. These are a great combat multiplier. Next slide, please. So how do we get after this? How do we fix it? Well, we have a, a, a near-term and, and a longer-term solution, and there's really three elements of, of the near-term solution. The first one I'm going to mention here is listed as two on the slide. It's called Conduct Volcano SLEP, System Life Extension Program. The chief mentioned we have these ground volcano systems and air volcano systems. Uh, for a number of reasons, they haven't been maintained and updated as well as they should for the last decade or two. So we're uh, out there working with the PM, working with industry, working with the depots and getting those put back into a serviceable condition so we can use them in the fight if we need them. The second one is called Field and Develop SAVO. SAVO stands for Standoff Activated Volcano Obstacle. This is a really clever use of a number of existing fielded systems. We're going to take our volcano canisters, our AV munitions, our spider network munitions, and our, our regular demolition blasting machines and employ these in, in a manner that will allow us to recover this part of the battlefield, the directed obstacle in the close fight, which we have assessed as the largest gap right now. This is innovative. It's clever. We're working with a couple theaters on it, and we think we can field this in, in the next few years. Also, it is a slide notes that the PPD 37, the one that said we would operationally comply to Ottawa, those policies are always under review, and, uh, and we'll see how that goes. But the, the point I would make is even if PPD 37 were rescinded today, it only gets after the fast cam system. It doesn't do anything to address what we have said is the most gap, the near-term directed obstacle in the close fight. So the long way ahead is we're going to start with uh, a new family of scatterable mines, a replacement system. The existing current family of scatterable mines we bought over the last several decades, and they were based on a common munition that's delivered by different methods and different platforms at different ranges. We're going to go with that uh, methodology again. So the first thing we're going to do is develop the common anti-vehicle munition. And we think we're going to do it in both the top and the bottom attack uh, configuration. When we looked at replacing Gator, we did a really good analysis of alternatives, and there was a lot of learning involved there. One of the things we learned was nobody knew how good a Gator was. It's really an, an effective obstacle. But the second thing we learned was, you know, we, we had this impression that the only way to get the effects we needed from the obstacle was to have a mix of both anti-vehicle and anti-personnel mines. Turns out that's not really true. What we needed was complexity. And so we can get complexity without AP by adding a top attack component of the minefield. So the far term plan is we're going to first develop the common top attack and bottom attack anti-vehicular munitions, initially field them in a mine in a box, sort of like Mopum's configuration, and then ultimately field that for the close fight first, and then move into the, the mid and deep ranges next. OK, I think that was the last slide I had. And I'll be followed by uh, Colonel John Slater, the PM for Close Combat Systems. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to uh, talk you through the acquisition approach for, this, for these programs. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I'm, first I'm going to address what we're doing for the intermediate and near-term fix to address the immediate gap that we've got right now. We're leveraging a brand new process called middle tier acquisition that allows us to get to rapid prototyping and la rapid production of capability, uh, all using through other transaction authorities. From an acquisition standpoint, it is extremely streamlined and this is actually the first program the Army is going forward with this. Uh, as Jim had said, we are leveraging the existing inventory of our munitions as well as several legacy systems for us to, to be able to uh, enable this capability quickly. Next slide. So I'm going to walk you through this chart. Standoff activated volcano system is actually a super simple approach to this problem set. Uh, top right of the, the block you see what it, we're calling affectionately is a smart base plate. It enables us to have limited amount of electronics and power in it. We will mount four separate volcano canisters in that, tether it by a wire uh, command and control uh, access, and then we will initiate it through any one of these three initiation methods which are common throughout the uh, Army inventory right now. What you'll see up in the top left is how how effective this is. One single volcano or SAVO initiation will cover an 80 by 80 meter footprint. So uh, this is a, a great enabler. I'm going to show you a video of it in a, in a few minutes. But the beauty of the technology is, for one, it gives you up to six months of being able to put this obstacle out as an on-demand obstacle. It can be recoverable. It will have a self detonation time of 48 hours. So once you launch it, it's not recoverable, but up until the point when you launch it, you can go out, take it apart, and remove it and reuse it. Uh, let's go to the next, uh, let me go to the next slide. Uh, we're gonna talk through this. These are just some very simple pictorials of concepts of where our, our smart engineers and our smart operations guys can put Volcano, they can put them in to the left like as a single point area that they want to have uh, full control over by putting out the munitions, or they can put them out in the full row mined area where you're trying to cover a significant piece of terrain. We're expecting our initial operational capability on this by 2022, and we're, we're initiating it this year as a program, and we're trying to see every other opportunity we can possibly pull this to the left. Next, I'm going to show you the video. It's, uh, you can run it. It, it. it goes a little, it's in very slow motion. But what you're going to see is how the dispersion effects happen with these munitions. They are actually connected via a strap that goes through the bottom. That strap does a couple of things for us. For one, it turns on the mine. Two, it sends the self-destruct time to those munitions. And three, because of the way it's weaved in there, it puts the dispersion pattern, it puts a spin on it. That's how we get the random dispersion footprint on the ground. Great capability. Um, we've demonstrated it several times. I know Colonel Hines is going to talk at the end about uh, how successful that's been. Um, next, we're going to talk through uh, where we are going for the future. And this is really our, our big program of record for a complex minefield effect. As Jim said, the uh, analysis of alternatives that was done for us showed us that we needed to have complexity. We also did trade studies on that to say what's our most cost effective way to do that. And that was through a top attack and a bottom attack munition. Uh, the more uh, peer our competitor is, the better breaching capabilities they're going to have and the faster they're going to be able to breach through what would have been a traditional minefield. So top attack, you're going to see, is going to be the game changer here. Uh, let's uh, go to the next slide. So this is, this is the holistic look at what the next generation is going to look like. It's really three components. The first, and really is the, the core to it, is a command and control suite. Everything in these munitions is going to be networked. It is going to be the operator's ability to command and control that 
munition field or multiple munition fields throughout the depth of their area of operation. So they're going to be, give them the ability to turn off the minefield, turn on the minefield, activate a self-destruct on it. Our planning factor for this is also a six-month minefield that can be in place with a 30-day 30, 30 active munition. So once the munition's been initiated, it will be an active minefield for up to 30 days. Our first employment of this is going to be what we're kind of affectionately calling a box of munitions, very similar to the old Mopams. Our intent will be is you will have a box of bottom attack munitions or multiple boxes you would lay out throughout the, the battle space, and then you would have top attack munitions, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those in a few minutes, the different variations we're looking at. But those munitions will sit in those boxes until we are ready to activate them, only when the enemy is there. So those boxes will be live, they'll, they'll be networked, but they'll be recoverable if we want them to be. Uh, then, then talking about the two different types of munitions, a top attack and bottom attack. Those munitions are going to be smart in many ways. They're going to have a whole bunch of sweet sensors on them. Initially, it's seismic and acoustic, some radar capability. We are looking at for the future as we evolve this capability to bring in other sensors such as IR cameras, video, all of those types of things that can, out, can be additional combat multipliers and, and intelligence prep for the uh, commander. Uh, so let's uh, go to the next slide. So the t we have two separate uh, contractors currently on contract supporting our initiative, both developing two very unique approaches to the top attack problem. The first to uh, my right, your left, is Textron system. They are leveraging a lot of lessons learned that we have had through previous top attack capabilities that were developed. Their system has four separate uh, munitions with a command and control hub in it. When they detect a breach or a vehicle coming into the minefield, it will activate one of the munitions to launch up via a rocket. It will spin, it will engage the target from the top and kill it. And you, we're going to show you a video on that. The second is the um, uh, Northrop Grumman teams look at using uh, UAV technologies where we would geofence an area, meaning we have essentially invisible boundaries where that uh, UAV can fly but it will have its own seeker on it and it will be called in by the minefield when it is being breached and it will bring itself in to do a top attack, another uh, uh, EFP type of attack onto the top of the um, uh, vehicle. We can go uh, next slide, we're gonna actually go through the two videos. So this is the Textron version. You see it spins, it scans, it identifies the target this is an extremely mature technology. It has uh, been used in the Blue 109 program with the Air Force, so it's extremely robust and mature. I think we're going to jump right to this next slide. And this is the concept for using a, a UAV. Uh, again, a graphical pictorial right now. The enemy approaches a minefield. The minefield wakes up. Once it detects that a breach is going on, that is when it will launch an autonomously flown uh, munition to attack the breaching vehicle. Next is, is our bottom attack munitions. These are very similar. As Jim had mentioned earlier, our, our AOA showed us that what we have for bottom attack capabilities are a great munition. They very effective. We know that there are some better uh, capabilities we can put in there for different types of uh, shape charges. We will also we are also increasing the types of uh, sensors and capabilities in that for infield communication, as well as ruggedizing it for the uh, more robust uh, countermeasures and uh, fight against the electronic warfare threat that is out there. Going to go next uh, slide is another video, and this just kind of shows what a typical bottom attack is going to do. It's going to sense a vehicle over it, and it will detonate on 
the appropriate time where it believes it has its best opportunity to kill that vehicle. And I think this is where I uh, turn over to Lieutenant Colonel Himes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Mark Himes, and I uh, recently commanded a squadron of combat engineers in the 2nd Cavalry Regiment. Today you've heard some discussion about the challenges and the gaps that, that exist with our current combined arms terrain shaping obstacles. You heard a little bit about the way ahead, and you also heard a little bit about the technical side. Being stationed in Germany, I was one of the first commanders to have an opportunity to test one of these new tools, and that was the SAVO that was just described. We employed the SAVO in numerous training events throughout Europe, including several JMRC rotations. From a tactical pers perspective, I can tell you that it absolutely increases le lethality. And if you're not sure, just ask the Op 4 down in Hohenfels. From our very first employment during a decisive action rotation, the Op 4 were caught off guard. They were caught off guard by the simplicity, by the speed of employment, and by the speed of activation. And if I remember correctly, in that first engagement, we destroyed two BMPs and one tank before the Op 4 even know, knew what had hit them. At the beginning of that rotation, nobody really knew what the Savo was. By the middle of the rotation, every maneuver commander was asking for employment of the Savo in their engagement areas. The Savo is a new terrain shaping tool. It provides the commander flexibility. And when properly integrated with direct and indirect fires, it enables the maneuver commander to shape the terrain, to develop lethal and effective engagement areas, and to protect the force. And I'll tell you from my experience in Europe, it's exciting to have this new tool as a responsive terrain shaping tool that works. And the last thing I'll tell you before we take some questions, the chief at the beginning talked about the ground volcano and how that legacy system was put in the back of the motor pool somewhere. Well, I could tell you that, that today there's a lot of young NCOs and soldiers out there that are pulling those systems out of the motor pool and they're figuring out how to get them to work. And if you could go to the next slide, I'd like to show a short video. A little bit difficult to see, but that's a ground volcano training being employed in Lithuania just a few months ago. And with that, I think, sir, we'll take some questions. So listen, we've got a lot of experience out there. A lot of you guys have been on the ground. You see where those gaps are. Certainly want to listen to any, uh, any questions you have. We'll try to answer them. Or any, uh, any impressions? Are we going the right direction? What do you think? And anybody will uh, we'll share the mic here. Who's got my first question? Gentlemen, uh, Bill Doe, older combat engineer than any of you guys. But um, as we increase our ability to see these mines, even though they're self-destruct, are we working on abilities to better record and document where these minefields are? Uh, not only for our own force safety, but also for uh, civilian personnel that might be moving through the area? That's a good question, and the short answer is yes. We will have to uh, follow all our stain eggs and agreements on obstacle marking. Uh, as they're randomly dispersed, they may not be recorded precisely on a, a minefield recording form as they were in the past, but they will be geo-referenced and geo-tagged inside these fences, and of course they will all, anything we put out now, we envision will have a on off on feature and a self destruct feature uh, to make make it safer, as you know we 've always struggled marking and recording minefields and sharing it, but as you know with automated mission command systems that these will automatically talk to and populate uh, the sharing of the information of where the minefield is uh, should be greatly improved also You got it? 
Michelle Wolf, GA. Sir, discussing multi-domain operations, have you been able to communicate with fires, mobility, network, expressing how you can support the multi-domain fight and how they need to support you? Again, yeah, the short answer is yes, we have. There's a separate terrain shaping study. There's one going on now that's been directed by Congress. The track is working. And General Lundy, the, the, the uh, Combined Arms Center commander, has directed an additional study. He's got all the centers of excellence involved. And he's thinking bigger than you know we talked about today, just lethal explosives out there to kill tanks. He's wondering, well, if I'm going to shoot something 300 kilometers deep, why don't I put a, a short-range jammer in there? So when the enemy gets to the minefield, not only does he have a problem with, with the explosive obstacles, but all of a sudden we've denied his GPS or denied his ability to communicate with his higher headquarters. So across the TRADOC and all the centers of excellence, and we're working with the CFTs when we can for lethality and the ground combat vehicles uh, to make this as, as a total army effort. This is not an engineer thing that's being uh, done by ourselves. But as Jim said, this is not in a CFT. <clears throat> so what we've got to do, and all of you've got to carry this message, is at some point out there when you think about keeping soldiers alive on the battlefield or being more lethal, how do we somehow make sure that the maneuver force understands the value of this? If you're a uh, division commander, that you can actually save a brigade combat team if these things are fielded and actually are used in the right way. So there's a little bit about carrying the message back out there so uh, we can make sure that everybody understands the value of some of these systems. Hey, great question, though. Hey, hey, Bob, good to see you. Is there any electric signal as it's sitting on the ground or as it's launched that can be picked up, uh, intercepted, and, and seen ahead of time? So, so I'll answer that. We have, uh, we've been working really closely with our industry partners, and we are assessing how we're going to set up those munitions. But the bottom line is, is they're basically going to be in a sleep mode for battery conservation, so they're going to have an extremely low signature level. We're also looking at some innovative uh, in-field communication techniques that may either be very hard to detect or very hard to jam, so that we've got some additional robustness that can be put into that munition field. Two minutes. I think we got we got two minutes, folks, before lunch, I guess. Colonel Stewart, ASAM and RA. Um, are there any linkages to either our other services, like the Marine Corps, and also, of course, coalition allies, especially in NATO and places like that? Hey, you want to go first, Jim? Yeah, this is going to be a. Uh a joint program, at least it'll be sure at least joint oversight. I think we're going to get uh, involved with most of the development, then the Marines may choose to buy it. We certainly anticipate there'll be other services required in, in the delivery of these. Uh, as far as foreign military sales, I, I think, you know, the world will be watching us and, and our allies will probably want this capability once it's fielded and developed. We saw a lot of interest uh, in uh, the last generation of the OSD leaders a couple, a couple uh, years ago on continuing to try to fill this gap. So we think there's a lot of traction here. I was down at um, Marine Corps Quantico talking a bunch of 03s, 04s a couple months ago. They're just as concerned to how they're going to take care of the Marines on the battlefield as well. So it's something we've got to watch out for. The other critical thing here that I think we're trying to do we can't afford the perfect solution, okay? We need the good enough solution. So what we're trying to do is to really find a munition out there that can accomplish this, and at some point, whether you upgrade the munition or you upgrade the delivery mechanism, most of this is all standard stuff. A standard artillery round that can still be launched out there can deliver mid. The Gator at some point can be upgraded with the new munition. The form factor is the same shape in almost every one of these, okay? You go back to the volcano. The launchers and the, uh, the racks are all the same. We're just upgrading to get them back to where they were 15 years ago. But over time, if we can continue to get better munitions, some, as you saw here with the top attack, new capability, and then you can also build in there, uh, continue to be able to, uh, innovative systems to be able to deliver this, we think that this could be the solution that would give us that critical neighbor on the battlefield. Hey, I know we're probably out of time. Closing comments, Mark. You go first. 
It's a great system. Like I said, from a tactical level, uh, it really gives us a tool to help uh, support that maneuver commander and uh, affect the battlefield. I do want to uh, quickly address Colonel Stewart's uh, comments just because we have been uh, talking with many of our allies and they are in the exact same situation we are. None of them right now are ready to commit to joining in and making it a multinational program. That's fine. We are moving out. Uh, the other thing that I will share is we have had phenomenal in, uh, industry partners uh, that have worked through what we did an initial demonstration of capabilities, and we've had a lot of great ideas coming from industry. So I'll just say that we, we've, we've got a great team that's going to deliver capability. Yeah, thank you. Almost what John said. You know, we have the Army excited about this. The Joint Staff is tracking it. We have the right acquisition partners, right industry partners, and I think we're going to quickly work to close this critical gap. You walk around this uh, convention center, you, there's billions of dollars of equipment on the field down here, okay? The Army can't afford all this stuff. We've got to be able to work where the Secretary of the Army and the Chief are going, where the big six. We've got to be able to continue to improve lethality. But when you get engineers out there still in 113s driving around, we've got risk. This is one of those capabilities that can not only help us be able to defeat the enemy, but be able to protect our own force. Hey, let's give my guys a big round of applause, okay?